kitchen. Oh boy. Good morning and welcome to morning prayer at St. Hilary's Anglican Church on this bright, sunny, but chilly November 3rd. Let's just take a moment to center ourselves, perhaps a couple of long, deep breaths. And let's begin. Those who wait upon the Lord shall possess the land. They will delight in abundance of peace. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, to the Father and, to and to the Son, Son and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was in the beginning, is now and, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is our refuge and strength. O oh, come, let us worship. And let us say the Jubilate together. Be joyful, Be joyful in the Lord, all, all you lands. lands. Serve, Serve the Lord, Lord with gladness. gladness. And, and come, come before, before his, his presence, presence with a song. With a song. Know, this. know this. The Lord, the Lord himself, himself is God. God. He, he himself has made us. us. And we are, and we are his. We are, we are his people and the and sheep, sheep of his pasture. Enter, Enter his, his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his, into his courts, courts with praise. praise. Give, thanks Give thanks to him, to him and, and call, call upon, upon his name. name. For the Lord is the Lord good. Is good. His, his mercy is everlasting. And his, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The Lord, the Lord is our refuge and strength. O oh, come, come, let, let us, us worship. Barbara, would you lead us in the psalm, please? Yes, of course. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit to your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, intent on putting them to death. But the Lord will not leave them in the power of the wicked or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Thank you. Janet, would you give us the first reading, please? The first reading, a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Oh, sorry. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I was trying to close off the pictures, but I wasn't, I'm not successful. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the something of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no air has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. His spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities 
with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Holy, uh, 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 Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today we have a particularly interesting person, especially for Anglicans. His name is Richard Hooker. And uh, let me just read you what it says. Richard Hooker was an English priest who died in 1600, and we remember him today as a theologian who defended the Church of England and its choice of the middle way between Roman Catholic and Puritan ideologies. Hooker entered Oxford University in 1567 and for 18 years devoted himself to scholarship and reflection on the subtle points of theology. He became deputy professor of Hebrew, was ordained to the priesthood, and appeared to be set on a purely academic career. But his learning, moderation, and commitment to the Church of England brought him to the attention of the authorities, and he was adopted Master of the Temple, an office of great prestige because it made him the chief preacher to the legal community of London. He held this post for six years, then resigned to become the rector of a parish near Salisbury, a few years later, he moved to rectory in the Diocese of Canterbury, where he died at the age of 46. He was a quiet man, loving to his wife and children, glad in his piety and happy in his ministry. But the church remembers him primarily for the one great work that he wrote, a majestic study entitled Of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. This work was addressed to a group of English Protestants who were nicknamed Puritans because they sought to purify the Church of England according to their own narrow reading of the Bible. Against this movement, Hooker argued for a more liberal outlook, which coordinated the testimony of scripture, the course of Christian history, and the values of human reason in order to defend the English church as a communion for all people, not just a small group of saints. The experience of our tradition has confirmed his teaching and today we honor his work as a true cornerstone of Anglican history. They provide a little bit more, but um, in the back of his actual writings, but it was really funny because as I was looking at it, it said um, that his writing was very convoluted, very challenging, and um, that if we did read them, we might want to read them aloud in a group and slowly. <laughs> He's difficult. And I did try to read it. And I thought, if you ever wanted to go in circles that went back and forth and up and down and around, that's a good thing to read. So I'm not going to thrust that upon you. I've got a little bit more about, about him. He is, um, he has traditionally been regarded as the originator of the Anglican via media. And that's sort of a middle way 
between Protestantism and Catholicism. That was what they said about him for many, many years. They're starting to see that now he didn't actually originate the idea, but he put it in place um, in writing and really defended it in a variety of ways. And so he is still attributed to much of that. But generally, I know some of the folks we've, we've read about, we learn a little bit about their history and their family history. And you can see that it has a huge impact on them and what they do later in life. There's not a lot about him that well, it's out there, but he came from a good family. I gather a, you know, a middle class family and one or two people who really became wealthy, not noble, not super wealthy. But his uncle knew uh, the Bishop of Salisbury and through that relationship managed to secure Richard a position at Oxford to go to school there. I guess that's how most people got in in those days. You knew somebody. And there that launched his career. Um, he wrote what we heard called The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. And there are five sort of main principles that he put forward in it. And just listen to these principles and think about, if you would, your church, your Anglicanism, and how do these principles still hold true for you in your experience or not? Number one, scripture alone is the rule that should govern all human conduct. Scripture prescribes an unalterable form of church government. The English church is corrupted by Roman Catholic orders, rites, and ceremonies. The law is corrupt in not allowing lay elders. There ought not to be in the church bishops. It's mm. interesting, That's right. isn't it? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, one of the things that they've that, that's been written says he really what that massive work was was about was dealing with the governance of church, trying to figure out how to govern the new church in England, and he attempted to work out which methods of organizing churches are best. And behind all of this, because remember what was at stake was the position of Queen Elizabeth I as the supreme governor of the church. Remember the, the king or queen of England is still considered the head of the church. Mm -hmm. And if the doctrine were not to be settled by the authorities, or if Martin Luther's arguments for the priesthood of all believers, where we're all priest, priests ourselves and share that role, if that was adopted, um, then the, having the monarch as the governor of the church was intolerable. And on the other side, if the monarch were appointed by God to be the governor of a church, then local parishes going their own ways in doctrine were similarly intolerable. And that's kind of, I guess, where things were at that time. You can see it was, um, it was a difficult time. It was the, just the beginning of the Anglican church in England, the role of the, uh, the, the emperor, the role of the king or queen. There's a lot. There's a lot there. So... Do you think that we adhere to his principles? Scripture alone is the rule that should govern all human conduct. What do you think? think? Alone is not alone. I think with other things that could be added. Not totally. I agree. This is. Anybody else? <laughs> um it 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 could be a, a a cornerstone for guidance to for good living that you use the bible and in in all of your mhm mm mhm mm i to agree to overcome your trials your tribulations to to for daily wow. living yeah You've, have you heard of the three-legged stool? No, remind me. I, don't I know a three-legged <laughs> stool, but I don't know if it's, it's a story about it. There's a story about it? Yeah, so. well, um, it's one of those things they say, along with, you know, what he's written and what others have written in this concept of the via media is the three-legged stool and Anglicanism. What are the 
now they're saying three-legged plus one, right? So they, they haven't quite moved to four-legged, but they're getting there. But <laughs> the things that really are the fundamental basics of, of Anglicanism are scripture, tradition, the church's tradition, and that could be the tradition of coming Peter as the first you know, head of the church, et cetera, and reason. Reason plays a huge role in Anglican theology and thinking and the way we structure and manage our church communities. So it sounds like he's, he's there for scripture, but you know, he did go on to make arguments that reason was fundamentally important as well. And um, in far part, what he was doing was laying a, a place where you could reason yourself out of either extreme, Puritanism, or hardcore Roman Catholicism and reason yourself into something that functioned in the middle as well as drawing on scripture to get you there. And tradition would be how we've always done it or how it's been done in the past, how that shapes us. Doesn't mean it should be stagnant, but that we should consider it. And the, the fourth leg, which is getting closer to being attached is experience. What is your personal experience and what is our as a community experience? How has that shaped our relationship with God? Part of the reason for being a community is to come together and shape your, and talk about your own experiences and share that with others who might benefit from that. And when you listen to others, their experiences of God, it might help you as well. And that's becoming a stronger component of what, you know, those four basics that hold up the church. He also talks about, um, have you heard about, oh, sorry, have you heard about those the three-legged stool, those without maybe calling it that? Scripture, reason, tradition, and now experience? I never heard it. No, I know, have I? <clears throat> okay. Well, it sounds reasonable. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. That makes you a good Anglican. A so good Anglican? Yeah, because you feel comfortable with the, that thinking. Because there are churches that only draw on scripture, written in a very specific way. And there are others who are at the other experience, at the other end, you know, where they talk about what's my personal experience and that shapes everything. But we tend to be that via media, the middle way. I, um, I looked up what is the via media just so that you know, I didn't stumble over my discussion here. And I found an article and it claims that the Via Media, media stands as one of Anglicanism's greatest gifts to the world. It's a Latin term from a Latin term that means the middle way. And it allows us to synthesize great Christian truths into a central core rather than focusing on an extreme. And that Richard Hooker argued that Anglicanism retains the best of Roman Catholicism, which he identified as the liturgy and the tradition and Protestantism, excuse me. And that he talks about, they gave us this, the authority of the scripture and justification. And, as, and at its best, Anglicanism avoids fundamentalism and liberalism. He also talked, you know, John Wesley grew up after the Via Media had sort of become the way. And they say that his unique evangelical Anglicanism comes to light in his ability to find a synthesis between the radical, extremes, and paradoxes, i.e. divine sovereignty, God's in charge of everything, and the concept of free will. He found a via media, a way to live within both. And that's what the via media offers us. Um, different streams are actually symbiotic and belong together. So the via media, I think, embodies also a sense of finding what's best and, and, and bringing it together so that we can live together. Um, and in summary, they say that Anglicanism offers a balanced faith that brings together the best of Christian tradition 
a unique balance of unity and diversity. And through the Via Media and the importance of bringing together the different streams within Anglicism, and th that's, that's what's central and important. So if you didn't know about the Via Media before, you sort of have a sense of it now. Do you get a sense that the Anglican Church doesn't sit at either extreme? I was just going to say that I think that we're sort of in between. See... Yeah, we're in between. Yeah. That's right. Rather than being, you know, staunch or go overboard in any way. So I think the Anglican Church really is the middle ground is what we follow. And Our if you other... look at yeah, I agree with you. If you look at our, you come to church on Sunday, Barbara, I'll get to you in a sec. If you come to church on a Sunday morning and you look at the service and its structure, it starts with a, a gathering, a welcome. Welcome, let's gather together. Then we look at the word, which is scripture. And we pay close attention to it. And we even have a discussion about it. Well, kind of a one-sided discussion in the sermon, but we do. Somebody spent some time thinking about the passages and applying them to our lives and talks about them. So we do cover the scripture. Then we move into the, the Eucharist, which um, is a sacrament and it's, and it's drawn out of scripture. It's not just listening to the word, but it's this new separate part of the service that brings in the Holy Spirit, it's functional, it gives everyone something. And then we have the dismissal, which, which charges you to go out, which charges you to go out into the world and bring them what you've learned and discussed today. It sounds like my phone at home, and I ignore it. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. That's okay. So you, you see you see the scripture, you see the tradition, and, and you do see some reasoning. You see all of that in our service. It's not just coming in and listening to someone preach for an hour and a half on the word, boom, and then you go home. You mm -hmm. don't come in and just receive the Eucharist and a blessing and go home. It's that mixture, that balance of both. And that's just talking to you, Jackie, about how we kind of exist in the middle. Barbara, you were going to say something. Yes, I, I was actually, because of the sermon I wrote last Sunday on the Reformation, that how important um, Hooker's writing was um, at that time, because um, the Europe was plunged into the Thirty Years' War that was mm -hmm. the result of the Reformation, and how groundbreaking and important it was to have this sort of um, a peaceful designation in the middle, sort of trying to sort out the way forward. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a reflection, I think, of where England was, because when even Henry, even though he separated the English church from Rome, that wasn't his original intent. I mean, yes, he wanted to get a divorce, but he also was really struggling with the introduction of these new concepts from the Reformation and looking at how Rome was functioning. And, uh, you know, like if you're rich, you can pay for indulgences, and in theory, you get to heaven faster than a poor person. That's not what it says in the Bible. That's not what Christ said. He said it's harder for a richer person to get into, into heaven than a poor person. Um, and so there was all that struggle going on, and along comes Anglicanism. It, as it kind of bubbles up from all of these things happening, and people like Richard Hooker help to put it in context and give it a way forward, where in this case is the via media. You know, some people might call the Anglican Church the Great Compromise, but maybe that's what life is in many ways. And also that everybody can exist at 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 a at a good le at a level that um, Christ's teaching was acceptance, not um, not exclusion, not, not exclusion. Yeah, you 
you could coexist in 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 an can milieu. You can. Yeah, I think Janet, maybe you've hit it on the head there. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Allow each other to 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 coexist. You know. Um, yeah, it goes right and back to all perfect. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. it, it does. It goes right back to creation where God created everything and all of it's different. Mm -hmm. So all of it's going to function a little bit differently and understand the world, the world a little differently. And yet we can all live together. And it was good. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 and it functions. Yes. It's, it's a via media in a way, isn't it? So do you, what do you think about that statement that the Via Media was literally at the Anglican Church's gift to the world in that it conceptualized the concept? Do you agree? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I, I guess at that time in history it was. And yeah. it has come down through the ages um, Now that you, uh, I look at some of the practices of the Catholic Church and so on, you, you can see where um, it would cause some division. Some, and, and you don't feel as confident um, going to God because you are so imperfect, so broken. Whereas in the Anglican Church, you know you are broken, so you go to God for 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 help. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, we started off as good, not broken. I think, and that's what it says in the in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. and God saw that it was good. But God later gave us choice. Yep. And that choice, we, choices we make aren't always good. So therefore, you could say that means we're broken. Um, I honestly have trouble with that word broken because I don't <laughs> think we were created that way. I don't think we started out that way. I think we started out as good. And that's what it says in Genesis. But we were also given choice and with choice comes a responsibility and sometimes we don't do that very well and we we move away from god which some refer to as being broken yeah. and that you know that, that all has to do with the devil trying to tempt temptation, us temptation right yeah yes. <laughs> but where is temptation is it what we want or is the devil putting it in us um i think it's both maybe <laughs> i don't i what i don't want us is to let go of our own responsibilities yeah. Yeah. We can be pushed and pulled. Yeah. But we have to own our own responsibilities, our own choices. You, you know, that word choice has come up every week so far in our discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Choice. Thank you for noticing that. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Choice. It's, 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 it, it, it's, a, it's life is a journey and we make choices. Absolutely. Um, it's e as if even, it's, if you, even if you're having a bad day, you make a choice to give in to the bad day or get yeah. up and get. Yep. Yeah. You know? Uh, and um, yeah. I wonder if you know, love, justice, honoring God, loving your neighbor, and choice are like the building blocks of our faith. And, and to understand it and to be a follower of Christ. That, that comes with maturity in, in study in the Bible and mm -hmm. the way of, of Jesus. You know, we grow. And, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which again is reflected in the Bible. If you look at the beginning of the Old Testament, 
right through the New Testament, there is growth, a growth in our understanding and relationship with God. Yes. So a friend of mine just sent me an article this morning, and it's called Mean, Angry, Old Testament God versus Nice, Loving, New Testament God. <laughs> I mean, so that's, just, that's the thought-provoking title. But it's about that change in our understanding of God and our relationship with God through time. And you can see that maybe the Anglican Church is an example of growth and development, hopefully. <laughs> um, and there'll be something else coming up along the way, you know, that we need to be open to and wise enough to listen to. You know, one of the things that I think you mentioned on the, the three legs of the stool, mm -hmm. and you talked about logic. And I think that that's yeah. kind of a sterile way of saying, really, holy wisdom. Holy wisdom helps you to discern the right path to go on. And I think that the Anglican, Anglican Church should claim that. Like, it's not just logic. It's holy wisdom. And that It comes um, as a gift, I think, from God. Okay. That's interesting. Interesting language. I've not heard that before. Okay. It seems kind Is of sterile when you say um, logic. Well, and I didn't say logic. I said oh, reason. Reason. Again, sorry. They're, they're different. Them. They're different. Yeah. I, I agree. Logic can be a binary. Yeah. And that feels sterile. Reason, I don't think is as sterile because reason embodies a lot, but I get where you're going. You don't do it on your own. Yes. You are gifted, hopefully, reason, holy reason, yeah. holy wisdom. Yeah. And wisdom has been there since the beginning too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Sophia. Yes. Wisdom. Mm -hmm. And in a female gender. Yeah. <laughs> Take that away with us. <laughs> <laughs> no argument from us no, no. I, I think god knew what god was doing um because you know he created this world and we slipped into a paternalistic existence and then he threw in wisdom well wisdom was already there but he made sure we understood wisdom was again feminine he was trying to balance the scales and maybe make us all a little uncomfortable at moments you know yeah <laughs> And, and I guess that's what the church is doing, allowing females to be priests and all that thing. They're making it a bit more balanced. You know, so. Yeah, that only took us 2,000 years. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and with that come other challenges, right? Yeah. That's right. It's like you open one door and bam, hello. Oh, wonderful way forward. But look over there, there's a bush with prickles on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But we're still in the garden, right? We're still in the garden. Yes, yes. <laughs> but you, you remember you said that his writings are difficult mm. in the sense that you have to read it slowly and think, is it that his writings are deep or just con confusing? Let me read you. I'll just read you a little bit. The person who said... He said his prose style is not always easy for modern readers to follow. It's heavily indebted to Latin. Um, and, but let me just read you a paragraph or so, maybe not even a paragraph, but we'll see. And you can tell me what you think. Life, as all other gifts and benefits, groweth originally from the Father, and cometh not to us but by the Son, nor by the Son to any of us in particular, but through the Spirit. For this cause the Apostle Paul wisheth to the church of Corinth, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, which three Saint Peter comprehendeth in one, the participation of the divine nature. We are therefore in God through Christ eternally, according to that intent and purpose, whereby we were chosen to be made his in this present world before the world itself was made. We are in God through the knowledge which is had of us and the love which is born toward us from the everlasting. But in God, we actually are no longer than only from the time of our actual adoption into the body of his true church, into the fellowship of his children. Sometimes I find um, reading Paul's letter to 
the Corinthians and so on, something like that. You know, it's um, that's a good point. You're right. You have to sit and think. And, and so with Christ's parables too. Yes. Yeah. I mean, doesn't Christ all says, "I tell parables not to, not to um, clarify, but to confuse." Sit down and think about it, guys. Come on, this isn't just a. It's, it's not a, a a sticker you can put on your shoulder and say that's me. It's. This is a challenge. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's convoluted. It, it includes the Romans, the Jews, and others trying to make sense of it all. That's why we can, when we look back at, at um, experiences that we didn't, uh, roads that we didn't take, we oh. can reason and say, we were to go that way. Yeah. You know, it wasn't for us. So, so two roads diverged in yellow wood, and I took the one less traveled by. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. He knew, what he, he knew what he was writing about, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So have we solved the issue of Richard Hooker? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I feel like I have a better sense of the time he lived in and where his thinking came from. And maybe the, the via media as pre preventing us with a, with a way, a goodness, a place to exist where others can exist as well. Not just me with my understanding. And it, I think... Sorry? To help us to be patient with ourselves. Yeah. And let mm -hmm. others in the world into the world, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's because it's, um, it's often said sometimes you have to walk in my shoes to know what I feel. Feel, uh, yeah. Experience. Yeah. yeah. And we can all move to them via media without letting go of everything we held true before. It doesn't say your way is bad and my way is the only way. It says, here's this place we can all exist together, mm -hmm. listen to each other and find a way forward, hopefully. And yeah. there's all this change, yeah. change, as they say, life is cyclical, mm -hmm. changing, changing, ever changing. That's true. All I have to do is look in the mirror. <laughs> you have to come to a breath of fresh air during that time in British history because they had Mary killing all the Protestants and um, Elizabeth, you know, killing all the Catholics. And, and here comes Hooker who's saying, well, we have peace. We have this, this middle way that can honor all sides, you know? Yeah, S soften the edges, the extremes, but don't discount some of the ideas, yeah. bring them together. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that was, that was interesting, very interesting. One last thing. Okay. Um, when we look at um, various areas of, of, of history, like um, different peoples, like in Ireland with the fight between the Protestants and Catholics, and eventually they come to a, a sort of of, of level of acceptance that they can both coexist together. It happens in, in, in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in South Africa, in, in, in other parts of Africa, in it, it's, it's in the Mideast, it isn't as yet settled. Mm. You know, so 
maybe this is what we are thought we are going through. We have to see that we all can coexist together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, a bit from here and a bit from there. And, and that's what life is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hold on to that. Let's move to the affirmation of faith. And together, let us say, Hear, O Hear Israel, Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God, God, the Lord, the Lord is, one. is one. Love, Love the Lord, the Lord your, God. your God with all your with heart, all your heart with, all with all your soul, with all, all your mind, mind and with all, all your strength. strength. This, this is the first and, and the great, great commandment. The second, second is to like, like it. Love your, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than, than these. Barbara, would you lead us in the prayers, please? <clears throat> Let us pray with confidence to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise, that all may share the good things you provide. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Set free all who are bound by fear and despair. Lord, Lord, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying and comfort those who mourn. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Amen. Amen. Grant to us, O God Most High, the gifts of wisdom and understanding, the following, that following the teaching of your servant Richard Hooker, we may cleave without compromise to those saving doctrines on which the faith of your church is founded and order all else most fittingly by the rule of love and the bond of peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your will, your will be, done be done on earth, earth as, in as it is in heaven. Give, give us today our daily, our daily bread. bread. Forgive, us, forgive us our sins, sins as, as we forgive those who sin against us. us. Save, Save us, us from the time of trial. And, and deliver, deliver us from, from evil, evil for the kingdom, for the kingdom of our power, and, and the, the glory of yours, yours now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be Thanks to God. Be to Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. Amen. Amen. Can you end the recording too, please?